Hello there fellow cultists, this is DM Nell and I am back with another Shadow Talk and this is episode number 127, I believe. And I am going to start a series of videos that has uh, to do with the very first Shadow of the Demon Lord campaign that was published, uh, Tales of the Demon Lord. Now I have talked about this uh, probably on numerous videos, but I've not done a deep dive on it. I had a uh, viewer request that I go into some depth on this uh, particular uh, campaign. And this is something I've been wanting to do for a long time, but I haven't, haven't really gotten around to it because it was, uh, if I was going to do it, I would have to do it um, in its entirety, meaning going through the entire campaign. And um, I didn't want to really uh, you know, devote that much time and effort into it, but um, I think it's worthwhile because I think this is a great campaign that is underrated and it gets a bad rap because of the way that it's, it is uh, presented and, and um, laid out. But I think that this is actually one of the best campaign settings, or not settings, one of the best campaign adventures um, that's, that has been made available for Shadow of the Demon Lord. And I think it would be a shame if people overlooked it simply because it was... Um, not easy to implement, um, but you know, again, even that. Well, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself, so let's let's uh, let's start at the beginning, shall we? Okay, so Tales of the Demon Lord. This is the first campaign, um, full adventure campaign that was produced by Schwab Entertainment uh, for the Shadow of the Demon Lord, um, RPG, and it was, uh, part of the initial Kickstarter for Shadow of the Demon Lord. So this came out, uh, probably around, uh, 2015, 20, late 2014, 2015, somewhere around there, uh, when the Kickstarter ended, and it, um, you know, again, it was one of the first things produced by Schwab Entertainment. So this was like right out of the gate, um, of all the things that they initially produced, that Robert Schwab initially produced, this was like, you know, in, in the first 10 releases, probably in the first five releases uh, for the game. So it is, you know, very early in the game. And as such, it suffers a little bit, I think, from that fact in that it was so early in the game that perhaps it could have been uh, fleshed out a little bit more, but I really don't think that was even the intent. So even if Tales of the Demon Lord were produced today, I don't think necessarily that it would be done any differently. Much to um, the chagrin of many DMs out there that I've seen posting in various places, Reddit and, and so forth. Uh, but again, I think that is due to the fact that, um, you know, a lot of campaigns these days, a lot of the adventures that are produced really go overboard as far as I'm concerned, as far as hand-holding, coddling DMs, providing them with way too much information um, and, you know, producing these 250, 300 page um, campaign books. And I'm looking at a, a stack of them right there on my shelf that, um, you know, you have to spend a month and a half just reading it to get a, uh, to, you know, to get a read through once, let alone being able to, you know, just pick it up and start running it. So I think the intent, and I don't want to read into Mr. Schwab's uh, thought process, but I think the intent was to provide just enough information for the DM to be able to pick up this book read through it once, which would probably take a few hours, and be able to start the campaign pretty much immediately. Once you have the understanding of what's going on in this campaign, what the storyline is, then you can just jump in and start running it. Now, the problem that a lot of people have with this adventure, with this uh, campaign, is the adventures are very, very, very loosely connected, if connected at all. Some of the adventures are just kind of thrown in there and have nothing to do with the storyline for the campaign. 
And again, I think that is on purpose as well, because I believe that this, what this campaign is trying to do is give you an overview of the Shadow of the Demon Lord game system. Because again, this is the first, this is the first campaign setting, uh, or sorry, this is the first uh, campaign for this game. And the game had just released. So the designer wanted to create an adventure that would give you a good sampling of what this game is all about. And this does just that. And it does that perfectly, in my opinion. I think it does, uh, it adds a lot of the new monsters that are part of this, uh, this RPG. Uh, it gives you a good flavor for the setting. Uh, it introduces, uh, you know, various items that are unique to this, the, to this, um, to this uh, RPG. And, you know, it, it just does, a, I think, a very good job of, of sampling the game overall and giving you a good idea of what you're getting into when you are playing or running a Shadow of the Demon Lord um, game. So... This campaign is um, kind of a tour of the uh, the campaign world, although it's it's not. I, I, let me rephrase that. It's not a tour of the campaign world because campaign world is an entire continent. It is a tour of the the game, and it gives you a it spotlights a particular area of the campaign world. It spotlights the northern reach. And a particular area of the Northern Reach, although it kind of expands beyond that area slightly. Um, but, um, you know, it kind of focuses on a particular area. Uh, so it doesn't make it so grand that, you know, you, you're, you are, as a DM, you know, trying to figure out where you're at at any given time in this. Uh, it really focuses on a particular area. So it's got a pretty tight focus. But it's got some big ideas. And some big things that can happen in the campaign, I'm talking like world-ending big things. So this is your, this is a, uh, a truly epic um, adventure, um, and it's kind of hidden. That fact is kind of hidden in, in 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 that it doesn't seem like it is a um, you know apocalyptic uh, campaign, at least for the first seven or eight adventures, uh, until you start getting towards the end where the big stuff start. Uh, rolling in and you realize wow uh, if the players don't step up this could be the end of the world as we know it and I feel fine so um, <laughs> the the campaign setting is uh, is really epic in my or the campaign is really epic I keep saying setting I don't know why I gotta stop that uh, psh. so um, so yeah that is tales of the demon lord that is what this 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 adventure is all about so let's kind of dive in here so for this first video what I would like to do is just kind of talk through the uh, the introduction and chapter one that sets up that's kind of like your foundation for this whole campaign if you have a firm understanding of what the storyline is and who all the major players are not even the major players but all the players that are introduced in this um, in this adventure, um, in this campaign, then you will have a, a, a strong foundation that you can draw from in order to make all of these adventures kind of cohesive, if that is your goal. So that's what I hope to accomplish with this first adventure, or this uh, first, <laughs> first video. And so uh, here we go. Let's just jump right in. So introduction. The introduction page here talks about, um, you know, how you use this book, what the setting is, um, you know, what the campaign um, format is. It's got 11 adventures, so it should provide you a complete campaign going from uh, the starting tier of zero all the way to the ending tier, uh, master tier at uh, level 10. Um, so, running the adventures, it says right here that an adventure is a lot like a road map showing a final destination and a number of, excuse me, a different routes that the characters can take to get there. It's left to you to fill in the details. 
to find ways to connect the characters to the story and to present the world as a believable and coherent place. This might sound like a lot, but you're smart, capable, and more than up to the task. After all, you're the game master. So it says right there that it's up to you as the, as the game master to connect all this stuff to make it make sense for the story that you are trying to tell. It does not hold your hand like most adventures do these days. If you're running, if you're running Curse of Strahd, you know exactly what you need to do at any given time because it's pretty much a, you know, it's a sandbox to a certain extent, but it is also, you know, at, at the end of the day, you are going to be going to Castle Ravenloft and you're going to be fighting Strahd. You know, this campaign has all these separate adventures, but the connecting tissue between them is up to the DM to to de- to develop. And you do that with all the elements that this campaign provides you. And with an understanding of what the basic storyline is for this campaign, which is the next uh, part here, the campaign story. Most of these adventures deal with the efforts of the ancient society known as the Brotherhood of Shadows. So the Brotherhood of Shadows is a big deal in Shadow of the Demon Lord. They are the cult that is trying to end the world. They want, uh, these crazy MFers want to bring the Demon Lord into this reality. So first of all, A, they know what the Demon Lord is, which is not necessarily common knowledge. Um, as far as, you know, Shadow of the Demon Lord goes, you got a lot of, you got a lot of bad guys out there, but the common person typically, you know, they, they know about gods, they know about the devil, and they know about the various, uh, you know, religions. So you've got, um, the Church of the New God, which is like the biggest religion going on now. Uh, you know, comparable to Christianity today. You know, there are all, all, you know, all kinds of other religions out there today in the real world. But Christianity is like a big one, at least in this part of the world. You know, other parts of the world, there, there are other religions. But um, in this part of this world for Shadow of the Demon Lord, um, the Church of the New God is, you know, the biggest. Then, but then you have the, the old faith, which is still big even though it's kind of fading into history, it is still uh, actively um, worshipped by many people in the world. Uh, So the common folk know those two big ideas. They know the the church of the new God uh, and they know the old gods. And the the thing that connects both of those is, um, you know, the, the big bad guy that everybody knows is the devil known as the adversary in the Church of the New God, known as um, Diabolus in the Old Faith. Um, the devil is like, you know, the, the, the one that the people, the one that people fear, because when, especially humans, because when humans die, um, if their soul is corrupted, they go to hell. And, you know, that's where Diabolus is, that's where the devils are, and that's where you suffer, not for an eternity, but you do suffer uh, until your soul is... Uh, cleansed and ready to be reborn into the world. So, you know, that's what the the average person believes. You know, the average person may have heard of the Demon Lord. Uh, the Demon Lord is just kind of a, like a boogeyman. He's like a, uh, a, a tale to scare uh, people when the fear of the devil is not enough. And now, tip, as we know in the real world, the fear of the devil has been plenty enough for centuries. But in the campaign setting where you've got dragons and monsters and goblins and, you know, so on and so forth, an ethereal thing such as the devil, uh, you know, ruining your afterlife is may not be bad enough in order to, uh, you know, set, set, set some people straight or, or set uh, the proper amount of fear into them. So you have this concept of the demon lord. Now, the demon lord is kind of like this. Another ethereal being that, uh, it, when it's introduced, it's kind of like introduced as, as a crazy idea of this entity that just wants to wipe out the world and and uh, you know rebuild reality in its image. 
Uh, whereas, you know, the devil just wants to eat your corruption. So, you know, the devil is bad as far as from a personal standpoint in the afterlife, but the demon lord wants to wipe out everything. So, you know, when you, when you want a really bad, bad, bad guy to trump the devil, then you bring in the demon lord. So the demon lord is really not a, uh, a, a commonly known entity. Uh, people who study such things know it. Cultists know it. Crazy people know it. Uh, maybe sensitives know it. Uh, but the demon lord is not a, uh, uh, you know, again, not, not common knowledge. Now, groups like the Brotherhood of Shadows are all about the demon lord and want to actively bring the demon. They, first of all, they believe in the, the existence of the demon lord. They may or may not understand the demon lord's um, actual uh, history. They probably don't. Maybe they have a, a spattering of an understanding. When in, in, in the, you know, as a DM, if you're picking this up as one of your first products, you may not actually know what the Demon Lord is. Uh, for which I would advise you to go pick up the um, Hunger in the Void supplement, uh, which will give you that background. That's not it. Uh, but at any rate, the uh, Hunger in the Void tells you what the Demon Lord is. Now, I'm not going to spoil that for you guys here. I've already spoiled it, in, spoiled it in other videos, but if this is your your first video, then uh, you know go check out *Hunger in the Void* because it's a it's a great book. But anyway, um, the uh, the the uh, Brotherhood of Shadows is a, uh, a, a continent-spanning, empire-spanning cult. It's it's probably the biggest cult. But it's so big that it's actually got splinter groups. So even though uh, you have all of these cults calling themselves the Brotherhood of Shadows, you have a group in uh, one city that is uh, the Brotherhood of Shadows. But you may have another group that's operating somewhere else in the Empire that is also calling itself the Brotherhood of Shadows. But they're not necessarily working towards the same, uh, using the same methods. They may be working towards the same goal. Uh, which is bringing the, the demon lord here, but they may be, you know, they're not working together is what I'm trying to say here. Um, so there are splinter groups even within the Brotherhood of Shadows. And that is actually highlighted here in this campaign. You have the Brotherhood of Shadows that's working out of the uh, City of Crossings. And, um, but there is a rival, the, uh, rival faction uh, within the Brotherhood of Shadows that enters the story and causes starting starts to cause trouble. Um, okay, so um, so the uh, the Brotherhood of Shadows uh, want to bore a hole into the void, uh, which is where the Demon Lord exists, uh, along with all the demons that uh, exist in the void, and want to draw the Demon Lord and all these demons into this world. Uh, in order to destroy the world. So, for this campaign, um, the, uh, the, the, the City of Crossings is where the campaign is set, and there is a um, presence for the Brotherhood of Shadows that's led by a halfling named Elder Fob. Now, he has kind of been a shadow figure within the Brotherhood of Shadows. Um, but he is a very public figure in Crossings because he is actually a member of the city council. Um, and he acts kind of like an idiot. He, he refers to him here as he's posing as a befuddled city councilor, um, but he is secretly advancing the cult's agenda. Now, under Elder Fob, the cult is more, it, I would say it is less of a let's destroy the world um, as it is a let's, let's advance the cult's goals, which is to destroy the world, but let's do it and gain some power along the way and let's take our time about it. We're not in any hurry. Uh, we just want to sow the seeds cultivate the seeds, you know, that's Elder Fob's method. He wants to go, he wants to play the long game. However, Fob has a rival for control of the cult, 
And that comes in the form of a human aristocrat named Pen, Penta, Pentacus or Pen, Penta, yeah, Pentacus Catrandam, Catendramus. Now say that 10 times fast. Say that one time fast. Uh, Pentacus Catendramus. I just call him Catendramus because I love that name, Catendramus. Could be Catendramus or Catendramus. Uh, I'm not really sure how it's pronounced. I call him Catendramus. Uh, but this uh, crazy MFR, he shows up and he wants to play the fast, he wants to go the fast route into bringing the Demon Lord in. But he's been working for a while to figure out how to do this. And he figured uh, the best way to do it is to bring in an artifact known as the Eye of the Demon Lord, which he has discovered is hidden in the city of Crossings. So Catandramus, uh, you know, he's been working where he's, he's kind of like uh, this guy, this, uh, this, this uh, again, it's, he's an aristocrat, so he uses his wealth and power, uh, but secretly is a cultist. And he's been, you know, researching and, you know, traveling the lands, trying to figure out how, the best way to bring the demon lord into this world. And he has dis discovered that there is a ritual that can be done to rip a hole into the void big enough to allow the demon lord to enter this reality and destroy the world. But in order to do that, he needs this relic, this artifact known as the Eye of the Demon Lord. So he's been looking for the Eye of the Demon Lord. And um, in the course of his studies, he learned that the um, Eye of the Demon Lord was once in the possession of a legendary vampire known as Lucretia, the Lady of Sighs and Sorrows. However, it was stolen uh, from her centuries ago by a demonologist whose name is Moore, M-O-O-R-E. So Catandramus tracked this information down and learned that the last known location for Moore is in the city of uh, Crossings. So he brings a cadre of cultists with him to Crossings to find the Eye of the Demon Lord to begin building the things that he needs to build in order to get the ritual uh, to work. And that is the central storyline for this campaign. Catandramus using the Shad Brotherhood of Shadows to bring about this, or to, to, uh, to do this ritual to open up a hole into the void to have the Demon Lord destroyed. Now, this is a ritual that's going to take some time. Captain Dramas, even though, even though he, he gets the, um, it's assumed that he has the Eye of the Demon Lord at the uh, beginning of the adventure, which or the beginning of the campaign, which we'll get to when we get to Chapter 1, um, or uh, Adventure 1. Um, even though he has that, there's still other things that need to occur in order for Captain Dramas to do this ritual. So he needs time. So he's still working in the shadow. He's still working secretly. In the meantime, Elder Fob is aware of Captain Dramas. He doesn't know exactly what Captain Dramas is up to, but he knows that it is something big and that it is probably not in Elder Fob's best interest. So Elder Fob is um, you know, actively trying to prevent Captain Dramas from starting a coup in his city, ta resting his resting control from the Brother of the Shadows from him. Um, so he is like one of the main um, or one of the central figures in this campaign. Elder Fob the Halfling, posing as a pseudo council council person uh, who is actually a cultist, but he is trying to prevent another cultist from taking his power. So. That's like the core of the story. Now, what a lot of people have a problem with is that this, this is not cultivated throughout all of the ad separate adventures in this uh, campaign. It's only featured in a little bit in the first adventure. Uh, there's a big part of it in adventure four, I believe. And then the final adventure, and maybe a little bit 
uh, with uh, the adventure right before that. But uh, that, that's really about it. That's, that's, th- those are the only adventures where the central story uh, kind of comes back into focus. Um, so all the other adventures have really nothing to do with that particular story. But that's because your characters that are playing through this campaign, they can't just come in at zero level and expect to deal with this, this, this type of um, threat. They have to be able to come in. Uh, they have to, you know, gain experience. They have to grow in levels. They have to understand all the moving parts and start becoming interactive, they, interact, uh, interacting with these moving parts. They have to understand what the threat is. Uh, and actually, there's multiple threats. Um, not only is the, uh, you know, the Brotherhood of Shadows a threat, but Lucretia is also a threat because she wants her Eye of the Demon Lord back. Um, and, you know, there are you know, various things going on here, but it's up to the DM or the GM to kind of weave those into all these various adventures. So that is the campaign story. And this is integral for anybody who's running this campaign to understand what the story is and actively work to incorporate elements of the story into the various um, adventures that are in this campaign. All right, so the artifact that's named here, the Eye of the Demon Lord, is actually spelled out here. Uh, You've got the Eye of the Demon Lord and the game effects and a little bit of a a description of it. Uh, It is a smooth sphere of obsidian, warm to the touch, and is four inches in diameter. When first found, the more wielder calls upon its power, the larger the orb grows. And it's got a picture of it right here. I don't think the hand comes with it. (laughs) I think that is uh, Elder Fob's hand because he's kind of gross. As the adventure progresses, he gets kind of gross. Um, so I think this is uh, Elder Fob's hand. But anyway, this is the Eye of the Demon Lord. Um, so the, um, the artifact or the relic is uh, described on page two and three. Um, it doesn't actually come into play uh, in this campaign. I mean, you, I suppose you could have it come into play if you, uh, if you want to, uh, especially in Adventure 4. It gives you the opportunity to confront Captain Dramas. And at that point, your your characters could potentially um, reclaim the Eye of the Demon Lord. I would advise against that because the Eye of the Demon Lord is central to getting the um, the ritual going for the last adventure. So if the if the if the characters have it, at some point, you'll have to take it away from them again. I suppose you could. I suppose you could say that. The Eye of the Demon Lord was only needed to get the ball rolling um, for the ritual. And then once that happens, it's not necessary for Captain Dremus to have it anymore. Um, and so by the PCs taking it from him in Adventure 4, it doesn't necessarily stop the ritual. Um, but um, again, I, w- I would kind of advise against that. I would I would allow the uh, uh, Captain Dremus to, to maintain possession of the Eye of the Demon Lord until the uh, the very end. Um, so, having said that, that means that, you know, the description of the uh, relic is kind of pointless because if the PCs are never going to have access to it, then they wouldn't need it. Unless, of course, you take this campaign and continue it past level 10, which you can do now because you have the Paragon tier, uh, which was introduced in Forbidden Rules and is also in the... Um, uh, a cult philosophy book. Um, you can go past level 10. And uh, if you do so, having an artifact like, or a relic like the um, uh, the Eye of the Demon Lord would, you know, be something that uh, could potentially happen. But at any rate, uh, that goes beyond the scope of this adventure. Um, okay, so this next part is another tool to help the demon, or the demon lord, <laughs> the uh uh, the DM to in, help weave those um, story elements into the adventure by uh, giving clues as to how that can be done. So it starts off with sh- your starting characters. Your starting characters are zero level. 
And when they're starting in the city of crossings, of course, they're going to have their backgrounds and they're going to have all these things. But you need to have they need to have some ties to the campaign. And this gives you a way of incorporating those. So any characters that have an academic profession should know the wizard of uh, the, the primary wizard of the city. His name is Charybdis. And he is the wizard. He is in a tower called Wizard's Peak. Um, now, he is not featured in uh, any. Well, he's only featured in, I believe, in the last adventure. But that doesn't mean you, that you can't bring him in whenever you want to. He is definitely a, an NPC that you can play around with. And use as you need uh, to, in order to give quests um, or to, to um, you know, have a reason for players to uh, or characters to do what they um, need to do throughout this campaign. So Charybdis is one of the big NPCs. That's why I've highlighted him here. Uh, and characters that have an academic profession, that's your in. Those are the ones that would have ties with Charybdis. Then the common profession, characters might have city residents in districts appropriate to their starting wealth. Poor characters should live in grievings, which is one of the districts. Wealthier characters might live in the coins or in purse, which are two other districts. Criminal, criminal professions, uh, characters that have uh, criminal professions, consider granting the character a membership in the guild. All right, so the guild is a, an organization that is headquartered in crossings. It may have ties to other big cities uh, in the campaign setting, but it has a headquarters in crossings. And it is the organization that controls criminal activity in this city. So this is your thieves guild. This is your beggars guild. This is your, um, your assassins guild, all rolled into one. Uh, more on that when we get to the leader of the guild. Uh, but if you have a thief in your party, um, or a rogue in your party, then uh, this is this is a connection. And of course, you could get um, you can use the guild in order to um, advance any um, of the guild's agenda through the adventures that are in this uh, this campaign. Then martial profession. So the character might be a member of the brown cloaks or the militia. So the militia is mentioned in here, and there's a person that leads the militia, which we'll get to when we talk about the other NPCs. Uh, brown cloaks are the uh, the town guard, and they're the ones that man the fence, or not the fence, the gate. Uh, they're the ones that patrol the streets. They are the uh, the police force. So the brown cloaks is what I used when I ran ran this uh, campaign um, as one of the. Um, you know, in initiators of a, uh, uh, um, an adventure hook. Then you have the religious profession. Anybody who has a religious profession, um, the, there is a uh, cult of the new God presence here. Um, has a great deal of influence in the city. I believe uh, one of the council uh, members is a, uh, is a priest of the new God. And characters of that faith might also know um, Father Paulus, who I believe is the uh, council, councilman that is um, uh, part of the ch uh, Church of the New God that is here in Crossings. Uh, all right, so then you have the wilderness profession. Uh, consider having the character come from one of the settlements outside of Crossings that are featured in later adventures. Hamlet, which is detailed in Chapter 4. Carbuncle, which is detailed in Chapter 6. Or Verge, which is detailed in Chapter 8. So this is perfect right here. If you have, um, you know, some characters that, again, have the wilderness profession. So you're, you're looking at somebody that is going down the Druid path or the, the uh, Ranger path. Um, these guys would potentially have come from these um, places that are, are uh, featured in adventures within this campaign. So um, this is the connecting tissue that people are looking for whenever they say that they don't that this that, uh, this adventure doesn't have connecting tissue. It does. You just have to 
you just have to, you know, get your, you have to have your, your characters uh, established, first of all. Then you have to know who has a wilderness profession, who has religion, who has martial, who has criminal, who has common, who has academic. And then you have to make mental notes or actual physical notes to, to know how to tie these, these characters into these adventures. That's your connective tissue right there. All right, so novice characters, um, it goes on to say here, as the group gets more adventures behind it, the character's reputation as problem solvers can earn them an invitation to deal with new troubles and crossings or its nearby communities. Additionally, once the characters complete their first adventure, can adventure a connection to an organization such as the Guild or the Inquisition uh, can keep them in the thick of local events. Now, the, the Inquisition is another, it should have mentioned it over here in uh, the religious profession, but there is an Inquisitor uh, that is featured in this campaign. Uh, and I love this character. I really played him up in when I ran this campaign. And um, I actually used him again in subsequent campaigns. And so uh, this Inquisitor uh, is definitely, his name is Randolphus, is listed right here. Um, but uh, this guy is, uh, is definitely a mover and a shaker and somebody who can, uh, uh, can uh, send the players on, on adventures and quests. So, um, so some of the other patrons that can be here, you got Inquisitor Randolphus, you have Master Dreen, uh, who's featured in the um, first level adventure, I believe. Commander Renna, who is the uh, commander of the militia. And then the mayor of the city, who is um, Karen Edgerton. Now, when I ran this, Karen Edgerton didn't really play a big part in the campaign, but you can definitely feature her. She's the mayor. She is a good person. Um, so she could be under attack. She could be threatened. She could be uh, in danger from any of the various factions that are working in this in this city. Uh, and she can also be a, uh, a patron um, if needed to perpetuate any adventure hooks that you want to introduce. All right, replacement characters, you know, uh, just kind of talks about um, how you can incorporate uh, things from crossings to uh, any replacement characters that are needed throughout the campaign. Um, okay, so that is, that, that's the introduction. And the introduction itself is, has an enormous amount of information in it to help you run the game, which is why I really strongly advise you to take the time to intimately familiarize yourself with the introduction because that is what's going to help you get this campaign flowing, get all the uh, characters interacting, uh, to get those adventure hooks in there, and to have a reason for these player characters to want to adventure in um, crossings and you know want them have them want to stop the Brotherhood of Shadows from doing what it wants to do. Um, okay, so I'm actually going to I'm going to stop right there for the moment. I'm, I'm I think I'm going to hold off on the city in shadow until my next video because this is already running a little bit longer than I wanted to. But one last thing, one uh, one last mention that I want to make about this campaign, and that is I keep talking about um, it, you know, introducing these, you know, weaving these story elements, uh, introducing adventure hooks and all that in order to get the campaign to flow uh, properly. That's one way of running this campaign. There's another way that is equally valid and actually is more in line with the intent behind Shadow of the Demon Lord as an RPG. So by, by doing it the first way, you know, and introducing story elements, introducing all these NPCs, getting the adventure hooks going, you know, creating a flow throughout your adventures. That's all well and good if you want to run a long form campaign. Long form meaning that you want it to last however long it lasts. You know, if the first adventure lasts five sessions, so be it. If the third adventure lasts eight sessions, so be it. If the fourth adventure lasts one session, so be it. Um, you know, it lasts how long, however long it organically lasts at your table. 
That's the first method that I've been talking about up to this point. The second method of running this game, equally valid and actually more in line with, with Shadow the Demon Lord as a, an RPG and the intent that Robert Schwab wanted to, um, wanted to create when he made this game is he wanted to make a game that was beer and pretzels. I can run a session in three to four hours. Um, the characters level up after that session. The next session is a completely different adventure. I can run it in three to four hours, half drunk. When that session's over, they level up again. They can go through an entire campaign in 11 sessions, which means if you play once a week, that's 11 weeks. And you have a whole campaign under your belt. Okay. If you're going to do that with Tales of the Demon Lord, you have to forget all of everything that I just talked about. Because if you're going to do it that way, you need the basics for each adventure. And you just need to have enough for your player characters to jump into the adventure, have a few combats interact with the story a little bit and then end the session so that they can level up and go on to the next adventure. So in order to do that in Tales of the Demon Lord, you're going to have to cut out a lot. Now, this is not a thick adventure. If you have the actual physical copy of the uh, adventure, which actually I don't have with me at the moment, but um, it is it is only... Uh, the adventure is only 46 pages long, and then you have some uh, monsters at the back. Uh, but it's only 46 pages long. Even though it's only 46 pages, it is packed with information. So I ran into trouble with this because I, I, I was thinking when I ran, when I first ran this adventure, and granted it was the first campaign that I ran for Shadow of the Demon Lord, so I didn't know really what I was doing. But um, when I ran this adventure, I assumed that I could run each one of these adventures in one session. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. If you run these adventures as written, then some of them you can run fairly quickly, but others, like the curious case of the errant swine. It is one, two, three, four, four pages long, but in these four pages, you have like three different adventures that your characters can go on. Uh, you have the Hog Thieves, you have the Missing uh, Adventurers, and then you have the Problem with the Beastmen. Uh, then you have this entire uh, dungeon to go through. So, even this one particular novice uh, adventure is enough for three separate adventures, at least three separate uh, sessions. Probably more. I think it. I think it took me five or six sessions to get through this one particular chapter of this campaign, um, and that's because I'm used to running the long form campaigns, and I wasn't used to just focusing in on one of these things and have the characters jump in, do that thing, and then they're done with this one and move on to the next adventure, which is Temple of Shadows. So, if you want to do that. If you want to have one session, quick, uh, quick three to four hour game, maybe four or five, six hour game, whatever, then you have to read the, read the, read each of the, or read the adventure that you're focusing on. Take the, the parts that you want to incorporate into that session and ignore the rest. Because otherwise you could run into the problem that I had where I was wanting to do it in one session, but it actually took me multiple sessions because I wanted to get in everything that was in the, uh, you know, that was outlined in the story here. Um, also, if you are going to be doing that, um, just running a session, uh, the, the, the grand story of the Brotherhood of Shadows and all that is, it's, you, you can't, you can't really weave that into all the adventures. You could, you could have like an element in the adventures, but it's pretty much just going to have to be like, uh, the X-Files. Uh, any of you that watch the X-Files, any um, 
any season of the X-Files that you watch, you have the, the, the main mythology, which is featured in maybe three or four, maybe five episodes of a 22 episode season. And the rest of the episodes in that season are Monster of the Week. So most of the adventures in this, in this uh, campaign would be considered Monster of the Week. And the rest of them, which are like two or three, would be the primary story. So you definitely want to introduce the primary story, then do the Monsters of the Week, maybe have a little bit of an element of the monster of the uh, primary story uh, kind of just thrown in to remind the characters that there is a primary story, uh, and then wrap it up with the primary story at the end of the campaign. But, um, yeah, that's what you're going to have to do if you're going to run this as a uh, each of these adventures as a one shot um, and do a full campaign in 11 sessions. So that is the second way of running this uh, this campaign. So I personally recommend that you do the long form campaign because this is a uh, this is this has got a lot of great stuff in it. Again, it's a great tour of the campaign setting and, and of the RPG, and it gives you a great uh, a great feel for Shadow of the Demon Lord. Uh, but you could do it either way. It's up to you. You're the boss. So uh, whatever works for your table. All right, so that's it for today's video. I um, want to thank you for watching once again. And if you're not a subscriber, please, uh, please subscribe uh, so I can get this out there and more people um, looking at it. Uh, one last thing I want to mention before I wrap this video up, and that is that the Kickstarter for the um, Tales of the, not Tales of the Weird Wizard, the um, Shadow of the Weird Wizard uh, is supposed to be starting on August the 7th, I believe, as the latest date I've seen. So be ready for that. So thanks, thanks again, and I will catch you all next time. Hail to the Demon Lord, and how do you turn this damn thing off? There it is.